Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, Rule of Law in the New Abnormal, Systemic Racism, Violence, and other difficult conversations to make good trouble. We have the very great honor of having with us today <clears throat> Professor Vernanio Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law, now in Florida, <clears throat> one of the leading experts both on healthcare law, disparities in healthcare law, and race and the law. <clears throat> Sandra Gangle, one of the leading labor arbitrators and a pioneer in many areas of labor and employment rights for employees and the marginalized for many years and Sandra's in Camus or Washington. And Professor Ben Davis, who retired from the University of Toledo School of Law and a special, special honor for Ben today. Ben was awarded by the American Bar Association's Section of Dispute Resolution, its highest honor for individual achievement in conflict resolution, the Dallenbert Award, Raven Award. This is not that award. This is something else, but it's to call everybody's attention to the fact that like Vernelia and Sandra, Ben is truly an icon. He walks the walk. <laughs> All right, thank you all. Thank you now Ben's much. going to tell us about his shirt because Ben has the most exemplary t-shirts. He had one yesterday, which basically said, confuse the algorithm. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so uh, what's today? Uh, today, this is actually one of my oldest shirts. Uh, it, you can see it there. It's uh, a yin and yang, uh, that I, but it also has a sun and moon at the same time, which... I think I bought in Woodstock in like 1992 or something like that, or or, or even, and it's it stood the test of time, <laughs> and it, and um, as today felt like the, I just put it, it on, you know, sort. Of, I did put on a shirt and tie for the for the event, but I, <laughs> I like to say that I've been zooming on the shoulders of many people, <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. But this is just one of those one of those shirts. There we go, folks. Well, yin and yang are the prime area of collaboration. Collaboration, on the other hand, is sorely and painfully missing in what's going on in this country and in Minneapolis, Brooklyn Center, right now. Well, you know, one of the things to talk about, the, the topic is about systemic racism. And I just want to lay out, because I always feel like um, one of the problems we get into is we get into arguments because people have different definitions of things. And so they get into an argument because they disagree, but what they're disagreeing over is the definition. And so it seems to me that I at least I like to lay out my definitions just so that people, you know, you can say, well, I don't agree, and here's my definition. But if you don't have a different definition, then you have to evaluate me based on the definition I propose, not just because you, you don't want the outcome or whatever. And to me, the thing is, I don't know that many people understand what systemic racism is. Uh, it is, in my mind, a whole system like policing, education, housing, employment, you uh, banking, uh, a whole system that has different parts of it, has policies, practices and procedures that causes some kind of disparate impact based on race. And the people in the system allow it to continue and don't correct it. It's not about individual racism, although that can be present too, it's more about having set up, it's like 
they I don't know if you watched that movie uh Ice Train or whatever it was. They set a train to go around a track. They established different levels of of uh of a uh, class. And the train is on automatic. No particular person, except to the extent that they keep reinforcing the policies and practices and procedures that has the problem. And the, the problem with the police is, is it's, it's, it, it is a system built initially on outright racism and has been transformed into a system maintained by system, systemic racism. Sandra, Ben? Well, I have been really educating myself um, this year um, in uh, racism. And I liked your definition, um, Professor Randall. What is your first name? Vanilla. Vanilla. Although uh, the, the, uh, I, we have an agreement to call me Professor Randall just so people out there don't start calling me Vanilla. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> Professor Randall. <laughs> Uh, and what I have found, I mean, obviously I'm white and uh, I never thought of myself as, as racist, as racist, uh, because for many, many reasons, I mean, I've, uh, I was a foreign language teacher that taught Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees, English. Um, I uh, have a granddaughter who is uh, black, who is, uh, who was adopted. And, um, so I've, I've considered myself kind of the, the, the a very non-racist person. Then I read the book by Kendi, How to Be a Non-Racist, and I realized, no, I, I am guilty of the same, the whole system, because I have benefited over the years by simply being white. I have benefited from the um, uh, the system that allowed me to uh, go to college and to become active uh, in in the, uh, the legal profession um, before there were there were black people that were welcomed even though they uh, had the oper same opportunity under the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 that I had, but there weren't any black people getting into law school even when I was getting in as a woman. Uh, and, you know, the lending, the neighborhoods that I lived in over the years, um, the school districts that I went to, um, I benefited from the whole system, which is geared to the white community and has detrimental impacts on uh, people of color. And so I really have been educating myself, learning a great deal, and realizing that we need to deal with um, we need to deal with systemic racism um, in so many ways. Brother Ben. Um, well, I, I I too agree with uh, with Vernelia. Oh, sorry, Professor Randall's uh, 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 definition, and. Uh, the thing that I was uh, going to comment on is there's been a lot of interesting shows recently on uh, various networks that have been really deep for me to watch. Uh, there's a new series. You're going to sound like I'm plugging people, but I'm really not. But there's a new series on, I think it's on uh, Netflix uh, called uh, Them, or maybe it's on. Uh, which is uh, them. The, it's 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 about a a black family from North Carolina moves out to Compton, California, late forties, early fifties, to an all white neighborhood, and it captures just that moment when there's there are those covenants against uh, uh, black people being able to buy neighborhoods, but they're unenforceable. So it's right at that moment then, and some of the issues that we've just described about the the uh, the the uh, primary banks, the major banks, not lending to blacks, and so then there were others that were charging higher rates and higher 
uh, higher uh, down payment and all kinds of ways of making money. Um, and those secondary lenders were essentially having a black family buy into a neighborhood. Then we would have white flight, which those whites would go to some other neighborhood where some other part of the real estate business would make money. And then they were selling the houses in the nice white neighborhood at inflated rates to the blacks. And so you're making money on both sides in this, in this kind of game. And the, the whites would be getting the loans at the primary bank and the, and the blacks would be getting these sort of like land contract type setups in that. And, it, and it's, it's really describing that period and you see the intentional sort of racism part of there, sure, uh, because of the neighborhood reaction, but you also see the systemic part of it too. The second uh, thing that I've seen, and this is kind of ties into what we saw in Minnesota, is there's a 30 minute uh, movie, I believe it's on HBO called Two Distant Strangers that I just happened to come across this week which is a basically sort of a groundhog day for a black man who keeps getting killed by the same police officer. And he keeps trying to do things to stop that happening to himself. And, he, and it's, a, it's a very heavy meditation on all these police killings that we've seen. Um, and then the third thing uh, is, uh, and I saw this, this was on HBO. It's called Exterminate All the Brutes. And this is a four part series. Uh, for an hour each. And what that does is it goes really far back into uh, the point in time when uh, sort of white supremacy arose as a concept. Um, and they, they put a lot of emphasis on uh, a 1478 papal bull called Exigit Sincerii Devotionis which was the bull on which was based the Spanish Inquisition, uh, where they were looking for converted Jews who were at home doing uh, their uh, uh, Jewish services, but also the infidels, the Muslims, okay, who had converted too, were also being questioned. And there was a whole effort by, the, uh, in, by this to sort of root out all this, so to speak, okay? And uh, it was really sort of the creation of sort of this vision of Christendom that uh, distinguished between the European and everyone else in the world. And there's other things going on there, but it was, so I've, I've been trying to get this 1478 papal bull. And you'd be surprised how hard it is to find it. You'd think you could just Google it or something. But uh, I do have contacted someone at the Library of Congress who was, actually surprised too that it was hard to find who was trying to find this because I, I wanted to see this this document yeah I had seen earlier things like in 1455 uh, there was a papal bull that basically called for the perpetual enslavement of Africans um, that uh, is kind of the basis for uh, the slave trade really exploding after that uh, but you know, though, but this other one, this 1478, is sort of the one that seems to be argued, at least in this particular show, as being the real genesis of the idea of white supremacy. And so, you know, when you read things like that, it's like these things are so so far deep in terms of what's going on in systems. Okay, and and the particular view of the exterm exterminate all the brutes is about European imperialism at the time, and and things like learning how to kill at a distance, which was when the modernization of guns, the cannon, all those things created this particular material, uh, military superiority that was also morphed into sort of intellectual or superiority and all this stuff. Anyway, it's a lot, and it's a lot to, to cover in, in a few minutes here. But you know, that's another thing that I, I, I read that I, I really want to I, I think about. So when we see ourselves today, it's like, well then a lot of things don't look so surprising if you think of how deeply rooted they are and also how hard it is to unroot them and also the, the capacity to morph, or if I would say it like that, from the end of the 15th century to today, there's been morphing and morphing and morphing and morphing uh, on, with some other concepts underneath. Uh, and every once in a while, you'll have somebody who will come up with 
a rationalization for why everything is okay the way it is, right? I mean, we see that even today with uh, the the voting rights issues or uh, with the, these police shootings, you know, you, you see, uh, or how the court system is approaching, you know. And how the politicians, the, the, I took off my uh, uh, video because uh, I, my internet's been acting up and it was lagging. What strikes me is there are no current politician actually interested in fundamentally changing the policing system, and that includes Biden. Look how he responded to the death of a uh, of, uh, child. Right. There, yes, the young boy. He responded by, oh, yeah, you know, this is so horrible. And we, we, but we got to give the system a chance to work. We got to give the people a chance to do a, uh, uh, you know, we got to have an investigation. But he responded to, and he did that in one kind of tone. But then when he got to talking about the potential for violence, there was almost an anger in his voice. In just the very next sentence, he says in a very strong way, there is no excuse for violence. I'm like, oh, well, wait a minute. You just said there was an excuse for violence. You said we do an investigation and perhaps based on that investigation, the outcome will be that there's an excuse for violence. So that even the Democrats and the Republicans take it further, but the Democrats support systems of racism by not fundamentally undermining them uh, 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 by uh, when they have the opportunity. And right now they have the opportunity. They have the opportunity uh, because they control to the extent they do control the Senate because the Democrats are conservative, are moderate Republicans, many of them. But at any rate, they, uh, they, they're unwilling to make any fundamental change or use what leverage power, like uh, the power of funding, the power of money to get the police to fundamentally change how they operate, and they could. Uh, th uh, th that I don't know here what they say about uh, uh, this is a local matter. I guarantee you, if they said we will stop giving you military equipment or selling you military equipment cheap, we will stop funding training, we will stop giving you money if you don't adopt that best practices. And the best practices is, and they can make a whole list of them. One would be in my list is, by definition, if you kill an unarmed man, you are not competent to be a police officer. I don't care what your issue is. That that at minimum competency should be, don't kill an unarmed man. Like we want minimum competency for a cop, for a surgeon to be, don't take out the wrong organ. <laughs> you know, they, they they take out the wrong organ, they can come up with all the reasons why that happened, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, they have proven that they're not competent to be a surgeon, they're not competent to be a police officer. So we're unwilling to do that. And, and, and what bothers me is we talk about it as if there's some discussion to be had on it. Not we in this thing, but we, the society, as if we're confused about what can be done. Well, here's my take on uh, a, a lot of the police issues. I think that, first of all, their training is very um, inadequate. When, when they are hired, First of all, the police departments today are having a hard time finding qualified people to apply because so many of them uh, have uh, 
some black mark on their on their own on their record that they can't even get a job. And so in order to to fill the positions that are available, uh, they hire people that really are probably not right for uh, the role that they're going to play. And then they give them a very short training program um, and uh, put them out into the 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 workplace. Um, usually with a, an experienced person as their, as their trainer. <clears throat> and uh, I think that in, in Minneapolis, the, the, the two guys that were working with uh, the, uh, the person that ended up with his knee on um, uh, George Floyd's neck uh, were basically newbies, fairly new, who were still being trained. And they, they felt kind of helpless watching what was happening. They did not have the, um, the courage to stand up against their trainer, their, their supervisor, who was supposed to be teaching them the right st steps, the right um, way to, to do their job. Um, and I do think that they need better, they need more training and they need more uh, uh, familiarity with uh, things like uh, race relations and dealing with people with mental illness, dealing with people who are uh, uh, acting out, and and deal. They need to learn about. Uh, uh, do you bias. think that? Do you think that explains why they shoot? Black mentally ill people more than they shoot white mentally ill people. Look at that guy that just jumped on a car and and rode, used a hammer, and then had the police officer. Over and over again, we see white people shooting, using violence against police officers and walking away from it even with the lack of training of the police officers? Well, I think that they need to, when there is a mentally ill person that has been, uh, you know, they, they know that the call is about someone who is mentally ill and who's acting out. And that's what, what happened recently with one of these cases that, that escalated. The family had called the police and said, you know, he is mentally ill and he's having uh, a, 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 an episode uh, and we can't deal with him. Well, you know, they need to be able to, to send someone who has expertise in calming down the person with the, the mental illness in dealing with them on a human level instead of treating them as a criminal. But I guess that does, I'm still, I'm going to go back to the question I asked. Is that the explanation for racial differences in uh, how, pe how police officers deals with mental illness? I mean, do you understand? I, I hear yeah. what you're saying. I, and no, I think that they, they, they draw conclusions, again, based upon uh, their own uh, bias, their own hidden, whether it's conscious or subconscious, uh, if they see something happening that they, that they feel is is dangerous, they and, and the person is a person of color, they're more likely to respond improperly and extre with extreme behavior with that person. Whereas if the, if it were a white person, they'd be more patient. I agree. I think that that's that's a real problem. It's, and let's it's, understand the distinction here, which is. Professor Randall's question goes back to where we started, which is the root cause systemic element of this, which are both, as Professor Randall and all of you have pointed out, not only allowance, acquiescence, enabling stuff, but it's intentional stuff, and sometimes mixed, sometimes both from the same sources. And then we also have the responsive situations, where if you look at it logically, who in the world would ever send a physical safety person, public physical safety person out 
to deal with an emotionally charged, a racially charged situation where communication to deal with that problem in its essence has to happen. Otherwise, you get a 26-year white woman officer veteran out there training a trainee who panics with an unarmed black man and shoots him, alleging that she has mistaken her taser, which is a one-finger hold with a three-finger gun. And that's not going to sell anybody. In the middle of the time that we are watching a trial in which for over nine minutes, it is indisputable that the full weight of former officer Derek Chauvin's knee and body were on the neck of George Floyd to the point where it extinguished his oxygen flow and his breathing and his life. And we're trying that case. What the heck is going on in this yeah. society? Why are we sanctioning violence systemically to allow this? And we got a couple of minutes left. Ben, jump in. Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I, I agree that it, it is insane. Uh, let, let's just, I mean, we talk about mental health. Let's talk about sort of societal mental health, that it's insane. Uh, uh, now, it may be intentional in the, you know, in the sense of that's the way the system is supposed to work, but I'm just saying the system then for, therefore is insane. I mean, uh, to that uh, we, we see this many things. When I, when I saw that particular person say, my bad, I thought I was going to use a taser. You know, I was like, excuse me? <laughs> Why the hell were you going to use a taser anyway? I mean, <laughs> what was going on in that fact pattern that made you think a taser was necessary? Right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, what was going know, I used on? To, I used to ride the subway. Let me just tell you, I used to ride the subway in the Boston, and I always thought the subway was great. You know, really, when I was like nineteen or so, and uh, everyone was friendly and all that. And then uh, one of my friends said that you know they, a lot of the white guys were nervous about riding the subway, and I said, "Why? Well, I think the subway is great." Said, yeah, because everybody's afraid of you. <laughs> and I was like, "What? This power I had to freak people out?" You know. <laughs> okay. like and, in, absurd, you know? and in our last minute, and I think that touches directly on the perspective and the emotional reaction of the 26-year officer who shot Dante Wright. Hey, any last words? Well, I kind of think that one of the problems is that, that until we acknowledge that police cannot uh, operate in communities of color as a system because the system is racist and biased and they will always there will always be members who are going to act on their bias and 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 we need to defund the police we need to go to another system of public safety no one's talking about but the system we built up from a slavery, because this is basically a post-slavery system. The system we have built up for slavery has built in problems that have gotten worse, and worse over the years. I'll stop because I don't want to take up the whole minute. Well, and, and we're out of time for today. Oh, but that's I took up the whole back. minute. <laughs> We've We've got a system that has elevated property over human life for certain categories of people. Yeah. For the benefit of another category of people. Let's come back there in two weeks. Let's see what we can learn during these two weeks. Please rejoin us, folks. We'll be back April 29th, same time, same station. Ben, Professor Randall, Sandra, thank you so much for your thoughts and your passion about this really critical topic. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.